The game theorist video called Proving Mass Effect's Indoctrination Theory is odd. What he offers is supposition, incorrect information, and contradictory anecdotes with childlike glee. So, let's see what he has to say. ME1 is an interplanetary hunt for Saren, a good guy gone rogue, brainwashed by the Reapers. The final boss battle against him plays out as a thrilling standoff or a tricky negotiation as he fades in and out of control over his own mind. Actually, the final boss battle is a physical one. You shoot him until he dies. You're referring to the previous scene with dialogue options. Mass Effect 2 is a race for ownership over Reaper technology. Mass Effect 2 is a poor story of discovering what happens to disappearing human colonies and how to stop the force that is doing it. There is no race for ownership of Reaper technology. A race against a mysterious figure known as the Elusive Man. We're not racing against the Elusive Man, we're racing against the Collectors, I guess. But the Elusive Man is the guy who tells us what to do. This sounds like you haven't even played the game. That game ends with an epic boss battle inside a derelict Reaper. Here the author makes a mistake telling us the final boss happened during the derelict Reaper mission, and the guy making the video knew better. And they couldn't be bothered to have him re-record his audio to fix it. I'm getting the feeling the author didn't actually play the games or just has a really bad memory. And Mass Effect 3 is when the Reapers finally get to Earth, and oh boy, we get wrecked. But it's not about when the Reapers finally get to Earth. That's certainly one location, which the story seems strangely intent on, but it's the fact that they come at all and to reap the entire galaxy. Through countless sacrifices, the galaxy comes together to activate the catalyst. No, the galaxy doesn't come together to activate the catalyst. It builds and activates the crucible, which is a self-built deus ex machina. The catalyst is a mystery and the second deus ex machina. Though the Protheans believe it to be a necessary part of the crucible, it isn't. The fact the author says the galaxy comes together to activate it, though, proves he doesn't know what he's talking about. The catalyst can't be activated or does it activate anything else, aside from our confusion? And the galaxy certainly doesn't know anything about it, nor do the people throughout the cycles know exactly what it was. It's kind of what a deus ex does, though. So, yeah, I can understand his confusion, but he's still getting his terms wrong. And if he's trying to explain a game theory, and if he can't get his data correct, well, his musings are going to sound nonsensical. Fans felt a disturbance in the force that told them that there was more to this than initially appeared. There had to be. There had to be. So a veritable army of YouTubers, Redditors, and Bioware forum members joined forces to pick apart the game, the series, and the endings frame by frame. And they arrived at one spectacular conclusion. The ending was a lie. It was happening in Shepard's head. The well, you get a whole bunch of people who hate something to wish it or something else and have them all agree that their fantasy is better and thus it must be true? The greatest delusional buyer's remorse by emotional ignorant fanboys, thy name is the indoctrination theory. The final test of the game wasn't a traditional boss battle, but rather a battle of will. And that's where he fails, at the premise. Here's an interview with Casey Hudson where he talks about the ending and why it wasn't a boss battle. But. You know, it was just it was just so video gamey, and nothing that we did that ultimately it just felt like there was an end boss for the sake of having an end boss, and that raises the question of you know like if if video games are a medium for storytelling, do they always have to have an end boss? Here's an interview with Mac Walters where he talks about the catalyst and how and why he was written. With the, you know, the catalyst, the child that you talk to at the end of the game, I had written that much more in the in the guise of what you would expect, um, you know, kind of an, an investigative conversation where, you know, he has something that he tells you, but then you get to ask a ton of questions and get all your questions answered. And then Casey and I talked about it and we were like, no, I think it should just be, you know, keep it high level, you know, give you the details that you need to know, but don't get into all the, the stuff that you don't need to know. Um, you know, like, you know, I was talking about like how long it, have they been reaping and things like that. And it's like, you don't, you don't need to know that to, to know the answers to the the Mass Effect universe, and so we just, we've intentionally left those. To imply this isn't what was done is not only to lie to yourself, but to do Mass Effect 3 a disservice. The ending was horribly written. To impose it was all a dream, just because the story has elements that involves slow working mind control, might be easier to swallow, but it makes it even worse, if that's even possible. And the most effective way to do it is slowly and steadily via long-term repeated exposure. Right, long-term, as in months, like with Saren and Benezia being inside a Reaper for who knows how long, the test subjects at Vermeer being experimented on for months, and 
Dr. Kenson and her team working near Object Row for months. It also requires someone with a weak will, something Shepard doesn't have. Shepard has not been in close contact with Reaper artifacts for that amount of time. The elusive man, by contrast, was also indoctrinated, but he believed that he could use Reaper technology to control them. But in reality, they ended up being the ones controlling him. He could never have taken control because we already controlled him. Here the author is using the ending, which he says is a lie, to say that Reapers controlled Tim. So which one is it? Did they control or not control Tim? Either the Star Child is real and did control Tim, or he's just a hallucination. This is an omnipresent motif throughout all three installments. I'm not going to argue semantics here, but because it's established in the story so well and that we have lots of evidence of how it works, it doesn't fit that out of nowhere Shepard is now indoctrinated the same way everyone else has been. A, it takes time. Shepard is not near Reaper Tech for more than a few moments and at most a few hours. Arrival DLC is optional and the Derelict Reaper level is under an hour. It needs someone with a weak will, which Shepard certainly doesn't have. Not only does it require time, it requires close physical proximity, and Shepard is never near these things for that long. None of the symptoms for indoctrination were showcased throughout Mass Effect 2 or at the start or during Mass Effect 3, where we had plenty of time to think and dream with Shepard. No hallucinations, no voices, no anything. For symptoms to start popping up now, you have to show the cause. There is none. The only actual bad dreams he used to have were the Prothean visions. The recurring dreams Shepard's having are exactly that. Dreams done for melodramatic purposes. Throughout the Mass Effect trilogy, Shepard has had personal conversations with three separate Reapers. Two of these brief conversations are remote. And one which is, what, half a football field away that lasts, what, a few minutes? Tops? These are certainly not indoctrination conditions unless the author is implying it has a cumulative effect, which he's not. He's come into contact and handled several dozen Reaper artifacts. Dozens. Okay, name me one dozen. This is obviously hyperbole. There is certainly a quest from Hackett to acquire Reaper samples, maybe three or four, but again, doing so lasts for a few minutes, and Shepard shows no symptoms. It takes months for indoctrination to work on susceptible, weak-willed minds. Was in close proximity to Saren's ship Sovereign. Shepard was never in close proximity to Sovereign, unless you're talking about the piece that flew into the Presidium. You could argue this Reaper ship at the start of Mass Effect 3 is in close proximity, but again, that's kind of far, and exposed at most for only a few minutes. An active Reaper, and heck, even ended Mass Effect 2 inside a dead Reaper that was proven to have indoctrinated people who had visited it in the past. One, the author makes a mistake, as the video text shows, and two, those indoctrinated were Cerberus researchers living there for months. There's a big difference. The writing is on the wall. Yes, it is, and it all says you don't know the lore of indoctrination and some of the events of the games. On every point where someone will show signs of indoctrination, and then applying that to Shepard, you've been consistently wrong. By the time Mass Effect 3 rolls around, Shepard should already be long indoctrinated. How is this possible? And by that statement, he's proven himself wrong. If they were indoctrinated, they should have shown symptoms, like during Mass Effect 2. Shepard was under constant surveillance before the start of Mass Effect 3 no one reported any strange behavior. But, all of a sudden, since they're running toward a magical blue transporter light thing, now it's all a dream. But that's not all, because Mass Effect 3 is a weird game, full of weird, creative decisions that don't make a whole lot of sense, or at least don't until you consider Shepard's possible indoctrination. Or the simpler answer, it's bad writing. The writers didn't know what they were doing. They were in over their heads. The fans were going through the five stages of grief, rationalized their buyer's remorse, by all agreeing that it must have been a dream. Oh, it's all evil EA's fault. Bioware didn't have enough time to hang themselves by their own rope. Oh, but Bioware actually did that, because that was a statement by the founder of the darn company. Remember those three DLCs made to appease the fans? Yeah, that's because of the ending. 
and money. But gosh darn it, wouldn't you know it, the vehicle gets destroyed by a reaper blast, right in Shepard's line of vision. Oh no, so sad, much tragic. Rip Hoodie, you will be remembered. Here, the story is trying to describe the death of a random child, which, as we know, children have never been in the series before, to the pain Shepard is going through. Because Shepard, at this point, has been nothing but a soldier with the demeanor of a static brick. And it's easier to do this by personifying that than to have a whole bunch of dialogue scenes of Mir and Hale going through the motions of suffering and loss and other supposed feelings a character like Shepard might have. That's it. It's melodrama. That's what space operas have. It's a little late. It's ham-fisted. But that's what we got. This is a guy who sent his own crew members to their deaths. But oh no, it's this random boy that keeps him awake at night. Or he didn't send their crew members to their deaths. Remember, the endings of Mass Effect 2 are variable. The narrative needed something solid and tangible to A, show Shepard's suffering, and B, something that everyone would experience, since the death of Caden and Ashley were also variable. Those deaths also happened in the first game, and newcomers to this game have to relate. It makes perfect sense to have a sacrificial lamb to then have dream sequences over it. This has nothing to do with some cockamamie story of Shepard suddenly having mind-controlled dreams. Shepard is having dreams because of his grief, because that's what they show, because it's a galactic war and people die, and he's thinking about them. It's that simple. To imply a secondary element is to demean what is actually there. You can interpret the emotions and motives and meanings of a scene, but you can't interpret how a dream comes about, especially when you're trying to jam it into a mind control hole whose facts you either don't understand or are getting wrong. And not only that, McBiscuits is such an important symbol to the game that the Catalyst, the weapon built to finish off the Reapers, speaks to Shepard by taking its form. Exactly. If the ending is true, that's exactly what happens. If the ending is a hallucination, then everything you've stated about the Catalyst is false. You can't have it both ways. And once again, the galaxy did not build the Catalyst, they built the Crucible. And at no point, no point in any of this does Shepard ever question the Catalyst about its choice of shape. They never stop for a second to go, uh, hey, how come you look exactly like this little boy that's been haunting my dreams for weeks? Well, that's a decent question. The answer is kind of obvious. Shepard's got more important things on his mind, like pain and the fate of the entire galaxy, than to go into asking questions about physics of how Emperor Starchild here can read people's brains. Why didn't something happen in a story is not evidence why some made-up fantasy exists to explain atrocious storytelling. Continued in part two. Ah!